I'm here in Alaire State Park, located in Wall, New Jersey, to ride their Pine Creek Narrow Gauge Railroad. Now, I suppose you're wondering, what is Narrow Gauge? Narrow Gauge track is any track built narrower to the standard four feet of most railroads. There are several advantages of building a narrow gauge railroad, one of which is that it can be built more cheaply. Narrow gauge railroads have tighter curves and use lighter rail. They are also cheaper to operate because the locomotives and cars and the structures along the line are also built small. Narrow gauge railroads are mostly built in mining and mountain areas where it will be too expensive and difficult to build a full size standard gauge line. While I did speak very highly of narrow gauge railroads and told you about their advantages, there is one key disadvantage, and that is interchange. When two standard gauge railroads interchange with each other, it's just as simple as switching cars from one train to another. But with narrow gauge railroads, you have to unload whatever goods from one freight car into another freight car. It can be time consuming and costly. Most narrow gauge railroads today in the United States are used to haul tourists. They were all once working freight lines until the traffic dried up and they were converted into tourist lines. The Pine Creek Railroad is an exception to this, however. There wasn't a narrow gauge railroad there originally. It was built specifically for the park. The Pine Creek Railroad has many steam locomotives that are in storage awaiting restoration. They also have two diesels, including this ex-US Army switch locomotive that looks a little bit like Dean. They have another center cab diesel that's pictured here on this pamphlet that looks a little like Dominic. You know, while I'm waiting for the train to depart, let me tell you a story about Dominic. A developer had purchased the old warehouse complex near the Denville and Western Narrow Gauge Railroad and was going to turn it into a resort area with amusement parks and hotels and swimming pools. The developer asked Mr. McCormick if him and his engines could help out. And of course, he agreed. One day, Lewis and Dominic arrived at the junction with the work train. Well, said Lewis, I guess this is where we split up. You're going to the quarry, right? Yes, I am, replied Dominic proudly. The stone is crucial for the foundations. Just please bring a lot of stone so we can get this over with, grumbled the steam shovel. Don't worry, said Dominic determined. I will. So Lewis took the train on to the construction site while Dominic headed to the rock quarry. When he arrived, Julius had just finished arranging his train. Here are your cars, Dominic, he said. Thank you, Julius, replied Dominic. But then he looked over. This train isn't long enough, he said. What do you mean? That's plenty of cars, Julius puffed. No, it isn't, stated Dominic. We need more if we're going to get this job over with faster. So Julius collected more cars until Dominic had a very long train. Are you sure this is a good idea, asked Julius. I'm certain, declared Dominic with spirit. He pulled hard and led the heavy train out of the quarry. When they got to the summit, Dominic's driver was concerned. We better stop and turn up retainers. This is a very heavy train to be taken downhill. That'll take too much time, said Dominic. I have dynamic brakes. I'm pretty sure they'll hold. Now, coming downhill, they had a little help because there's some very slight upgrades that help give them resistance before the line really drops off. When they passed the water tank and siding, they realized that they weren't slowing down. Oh no, said Dominic. This isn't good. And it wasn't. The heavy rock car surged into him, forcing him downhill. Dominic's driver fought for control, but it was no use. Dominic's brakes were rock solid. His driver even had to release the brakes slightly so they could make it around some of the curves and to avoid Dominic having a wheel flat. This was the most frightened Dominic has been in his entire life. 
As they reached the bottom of the hill, they began to slow down slightly. But then suddenly, as they rounded a curve, the first truck of the front freight car came off the rails. Just hold on, Dominic, called his driver. We'll re-rail it once we stop. But they weren't going to get a chance. As they crossed the bridge, Dominic heard a deputy crack from behind him. The first three cars had derailed on the bridge and plunged into the river. Oh no, he said. What will Mr. McCormick say? He found out soon enough. He arrived on board Frederick, who brought the wrecker to clean up the mess. Dominic, you should know better than to come down the hill at that speed. I tried to hold the car, sir. I really did. But the train was too heavy for you, wasn't it? He asked. Yes, sir, it was, said Dominic sadly. Once those cars are recovered, I want you to take the rest of your train to the construction site. On the double. Is that clear? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir, said Dominic sadly. Dominic collected the cars that were still on the rails and with tears in his eyes, rumbled away. Mr. Alt, Mr. McCormick's assistant manager, was overseeing the operation at the construction site. He was very surprised to see a long train of stone backing in and seeing Dominic with a very downcast face. What's the matter, Dominic? asked Mr. Alt. Dominic, who was still very teary-eyed and sad, explained everything. I just want to do a good job and make Mr. McCormick proud, sir. He whimpered. I know you do, said Mr. Alt kindly. You're very highly strung, so when you make a mistake like this, it really bothers you. Dominic looked down at his front coupler. But, continued Mr. Alt, it would be better if you brought less cars. What do you mean? asked Dominic. He was puzzled. He thought more cars were good. You gotta remember, it's quality over quantity. Even if you do a little bit, you can look back and say, hey, at least I did the job correctly. Dominic thought about what Mr. Alt said. I'll try it tomorrow, sir. So the next morning, Dominic again made his way up to the quarry. He kept repeating what Mr. Alt said to him. Quality over quantity. Quality over quantity. Dominic collected his cars, a much shorter train this time, and started his day's work. Dominic delivered the last train safely. Bringing that little bit of rocks, we'll never finish this job, muttered the steam shovel. I didn't bring a lot of rock this time, said Dominic confidently, but at least I did the job right. The steam shovel only rolled its eyes. Good work, Dominic, said Mr. Alts with a smile. I will make sure Mr. McCormick hears about this. Dominic felt proud. And also, thank you for the advice, sir. I never would have done this well without you. No problem, said Mr. Alts. Now go back to your shed and get a nice rest. You got more stone to collect tomorrow. As soon as Dominic was uncoupled, that's exactly what he did. While waiting for the train to take us around the park, I looked next to me and showed that the Pine Street Railroad built an example of dual gauge track. Dual gauge track allows for both standard and narrow gauge locomotives and rolling stock to travel on the same track, just like Denville on the Southern United Railroad in Denville and Western. 
Both standard and narrow gauge trains call it Denville. Many of the industries in Denville are supplied with standard gauge cars, but are sometimes switched with the Denville and Western narrow gauge engines. This is accomplished by using a special idler car equipped with both standard and narrow gauge couplers. continuously operating one of our museums in the country. We're celebrating our 70th anniversary this year. Uh, we started back in Marlboro, New Jersey along Route 9, 1952. We moved here to the park in 1963. We've been running here ever since. A lot of people assume that since we're on state property, the history of the, of the train you're riding in today, the locomotive leading today's train is United States Army number 7751. 7751 was built for the United States Army in 1942 and was sent to serve at the Pearl Harbor bases during the height of World War II. This, uh, this locomotive stuffed all sorts of uh, cars loaded with people, military equipment, uh, aid for the rebuild of the base, all that stuff all around the base in New Jersey until the early 1920s. This one, most railroads were facing a same, the same issue with this type of car. They were way too small and uh, not wide enough to carry the carry the heavy and um, heavy and large goods on that were tr starting to travel on the railroad economically. Now, most railroads decided to tor to uh, torch these types of cars and, and pick up the scrap metal that was left after the car was started burning. We eventually had to reconfigure the braking system, but this car pretty much has been running on our railroad for about 49 years now, which, uh, which funnily enough, is almost the same amount of time it ran as a caboose for Central in New Jersey. If you look on the left side of the train, you'll be able to see another, the other naval flag car frame. This is what our car, this, the car you're all riding in today, used to look like. Uh, so you can imagine how much work it took to restore this, restore this car. see a steam engine in our station area, the green car we just passed, and the white path. After going around the park twice, I decided to get several run-by shots of the train. Although there wasn't an original narrow gauge railroad here, the Pennsylvania Railroad did have a branch line that ran to Seagrit, New Jersey that ran through this area. School children used to use the train to get from Seagrit to attend school and train. You know, a similar service operates on the Denville and Western Railroad. I'll tell you all about it. Elderville is a small town located in the mountains at the foot of the climb to Donna Pass on the Denville and Western. It has houses, a general store where you can get most of your groceries, a huge power station where most of the town's people work, and a school. But the school only goes up 
to eighth grade. When the students that live there have to start attending high school, they go to Denville High. And they get there in a very unique way. They take a train called the school train. Any engine on the Denville and Western can be rushed to pull it, even one of the geared logging engines. The engines pull the train to Elderville Tender first and use a small yard there to run around the train. They then pull into the station to collect the students and head back down to Denville. Once at Denville Station, they get off the train and head for the school, which is only a short walk from the station. At the end of the school day, they're brought back to Elderville. The engine would again run around the two passenger cars and even sometimes pick up some freight that has to go up to Denville from Elderville. And it goes on and on from Monday through Friday. It was the first day of school and Malcolm took the first school train of the year. He pulled into Denville Station on time and the children hopped out of the passenger car ready to start another school year. Two teens walked over to Malcolm. Thank you for the trip, Malcolm, said one. We're glad you were the first one to take us, said another. Oh, no problem, said Malcolm. I can't wait to see you two graduate this year. Now go on before you're late. Okay, Malcolm, we'll see you this afternoon. Nia was in the yard waiting for her train. Who were they, she asked Malcolm. Oh, that's Hugh and Brandon, he answered. You seem pretty close to them, Nia puffed. I really am, Malcolm told her. Would you like to hear about how I got so close to them? Sure, smiled Nia. All right, said Malcolm. And this is the story Malcolm told her. It all started last school year. Hugh and Brandon were in history class. Before the bell rang, the teacher made an announcement. Okay, class, I have a very special assignment for you. I want you to get into teams of two and make a World War II diorama. It is Wednesday. You have until next Friday to get the assignment in or it won't count. Yes, Mr. Sanchez, the students all said in unison. Of course, Hugh and Brandon being best friends picked each other. After they were let out of school, Hugh said to Brandon, Do you want to come to my house and play some video games? I sure do, replied Brandon. And they ran for the school train. Now, Hugh and Brandon aren't bad kids. They tend to goof off with never anything too serious to get them any any bad trouble. But the, sometimes they have a tendency to procrastinate. This led to many late assignments. Days and days went by. Hugh and Brandon kept putting off the assignment until uh, at a point, it seems like they had forgotten all about it. A whole weekend even passed. When Tuesday morning came again, at the end of class, their history teacher reminded them about the assignment. Remember class, your dioramas are due Friday. You and Brandon looked at each other. The bell rang and they began walking to their next class. We're so gonna fail, said Brandon. How could we be so stupid? I don't know, said Hugh, but we have to do something fast. We get an F on that assignment, our parents will ground us until we're old enough to drink. So that day, after getting off the school train, they went to the general store to grab all kinds of supplies. The two spent the next two afternoons working on it as hard as they could. By the time Thursday afternoon came, they were only half done. We're gonna fail, Brandon said nervously. If only we had more time, said Hugh. Just then they heard a noise and looked out the window. The noise turned out to be Vincent and Dean, who were delivering coal to the power station. The two teens watched as they were switched off the main track and began getting their coal cars unloaded. This gave Hugh an idea. You know, Brandon, if we didn't make it to school tomorrow, then they can't possibly fail us for not completing the assignment, especially if we're not there. How do you suppose we do that, said Brandon. Hugh told him his plan. Dude, that's genius, Brandon said brightly. The next day, Hugh and Brandon got to the station bright and early before the other kids had got there. This day, Malcolm was pulling the school train. 
He did the normal procedure, backed up to the power station switch, and went into the yard. Hugh and Brandon then snuck over to the switch. They turned it and put an object in it so it'll jam. And then they quickly ran back to the station. By this time, Malcolm had successfully ran around his train and his conductor was looking out to make sure everything was okay. He then noticed the switch. Stop! He shouted, stop! Malcolm's driver applied the brakes. What's wrong? Malcolm called. The switch is set the wrong way. I don't know how that could have happened. Well, no time to dwell on it now. I gotta throw it back. But when he tried to turn the switch back, it wouldn't budge. He tried as hard as he could. Uh, uh. He then walked over to Malcolm and his crew. Not only did the switch mysteriously turn against us, it's jammed shut. We can't move it. Well, this is just terrific, grumbled Malcolm. The conductor walked over to the station. Well, kids, looks like the school train is stuck. You and Brandon looked at each other and winked. Mr. McCormick was called and a new school train was hastily brought up along with Dean and the works train. The teens quickly boarded and Dewan took them down to Denville to attend school while Dean stayed behind with the works train. They let Sapphire pass through with the daily passenger train and then began to work on the switch. It took most of the morning, but soon the switch was mended and was able to turn freely. And Malcolm was freed from the sighting. He and Brandon eventually did get to school, but they missed history class. The two were relieved. They spoke about it at lunch. Boy, that was a clever stunt we pulled, said Hugh to Brandon. You better believe it, said Brandon, and no be none the wiser that we tampered with that switch. It was unlucky for our friends Brandon and Hugh that another student happened to be walking by while they were talking about it and hastily reported them to the principal. After lunch, Hugh and Brandon were walking to their next class when the principal stopped them. Hugh, Brandon, can I see you two in my office? The two teens said nothing and obliged. When they walked into his office, they saw Mr. McCormick standing there with his arms folded. They knew right then they were caught. Mr. McCormick gave them a lecture about how dangerous it is to tamper with railroad switches. Brandon and Hugh were sorry at once. Their punishment was to spend most of every Saturday working for the railroad. They worked at Elderville Station, and then down in Denville cleaning passenger cars. The two boys detested it at first, but then eventually grew to like it, and it became less of a punishment for them. They liked working at Denville because they could talk to all the engines. Their favorite one to talk to was Malcolm. They apologized for trapping him, and Malcolm always told them stories about what it was like working as a Navy engine. Brandon and Hugh were impressed by these stories, and Malcolm quickly became their number one favorite engine on the railroad. They grew so close to them that Malcolm's driver and fireman became friends of both their families. When Hugh's birthday came along in the spring, he convinced his parents to hold it next to a siding so Malcolm can attend. On the final day of the school year, Malcolm's driver invited Hugh and Brandon into the cab for their journey home. Thanks, Malcolm, said Brandon with a big smile. We'll be busy most of the summer, said Hugh, but don't worry, we'll make time to help out on the railroad. We'd love to have you helping out, Malcolm smiled. And they did, Malcolm concluded. They came by every two weeks during the summer. I mean, I can't blame them, they're teen boys. Of course, they don't want to hang around trains all the time. Well, but this is their last year. They'll be off to college soon. I hope they do well. Well, it seems like they have good families as role models, Nia said. She then paused. And a great engine to influence them too. Malcolm smiled. Well, I guess you can say I'm a grand engine.
Well, Mia had to laugh. It sounded silly, but it certainly was true. And I don't think anyone would ever try to dispute that.